Um, uh, one moment. I, thank you. That was terrific. When Glass-Steagall was written in 1933 by President Roosevelt and adopted, uh, it had eight pages. Uh, uh, the Frank Dodd Bill, which doesn't come anywhere near to, to doing what Glass-Steagall did, is over 2,000 pages. And invariably and inevitably, the law of unintended consequences come into play. Um, how did we get from eight pages to over 2,000? Um, in the 1960s, when we woke up to all the abuses I mentioned, the legal scholars came up with a theory that we would no longer need to give anybody in responsibility the ability to make a decision, that we could actually turn government into a kind of a software program. And we make laws as precise as possible. We th people thought they were smarter. And when anyone had a dispute, we would give them the, the right to sue for anything, to block the power line or anything. And it would be the most fair society ever because you could never blame anyone for anything because judges wouldn't make decisions, officials wouldn't make decisions. We would have a legal code that laid everything out. And you still hear conservatives saying, just give me clear law as if life can be set forth clearly. You know, every single child is different in the classroom. It can't be so. And so we got this system where it literally started accelerating. It was like something out of Gulliver's Travels. You know, you got this, 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 this little monster that grew and grew and grew. It's a progressive disease. We're more paralyzed than we were 10 years ago than we were 20 years ago because the law just keeps adding up. It's a bad theory of how you run government. It's really just the wrong idea. Mr. Cassidy, then Dr. Clinton. So um, it's interesting you brought up uh, the Dodd-Frank bill, which is the long bill. And uh, Matt Taibbi, the brilliant writer who's writing today on economics, points out that there have been more than 350 visits by the banking industry to the, to the regulators that are writing the regulations for that bill to piece by piece dismantle that bill. And, and it's going to happen. The Dodd-Frank bill, even though it's not that great a bill, is going to be dismantled by the corporate interests, the banking interests of this country. And I'm so tired of hearing people speak as if government is the enemy of this country. Government is not the enemy. The enemy is corporations. And Bobby Kennedy Jr. came to this town three weeks ago and said, when the government controls corporations, it's called communism. And when co corporations control government, it's called fascism. And we, sir, are in fascism. And that is the fault of the corporations of this country. And you need to direct your attention to what the corporations of this country are doing to take away the rights of the people. And everything that's happening in Washington is happening because the corporations want it. And when they have when you, take, you say that we, they redid their universal code, their universal commercial code, that's, I, I, I'm not surprised because that is a code that takes care of corporations and their contracts. So it's all been redone. But all the let other him, codes, let him Let him respond. Um, yeah, I think what you just, the, the emotion you expressed is part of the problem. Yeah, it's I not, know, it's not wait, the wait, solution. Wait, it's not the solution. Um, I don't hold any candle for corporations. They're largely amoral. You don't trust them to do anything. I agree with that. And, and, and they have spe special interest on the other side, organized labor. I could give you chapter and verse of abuses by organized labor. I could give you chapter and verse of abuses by my friends who run environmental groups who don't allow reasonable things to happen because they're afraid that it'll set some precedent if you do the reasonable thing. They want to have ultimate control. So. I think the entire system of Washington, the culture of Washington, is completely broken. I don't think corporations are only to blame. Uh, the, the regulatory approval process for the FDA, which is really important, and I write about, just to be clear, giving government officials more authority. That's what I'm writing about. I'm not taking it away. I'm not an anti-government person. I'm about giving them more authority so they can regulate whoever needs to get regulated. But the FDA now, will take years unnecessarily when there's a life-saving drug because they're so scared of being criticized if there's an unintended uh, uh, consequence of it. So we don't get the benefits of saving 10,000 lives because they're afraid, which probably will happen, that 10 lives won't be saved. 
Government has to make those hard choices, and it's not making those choices. So I think government's not working in all directions, not just in one direction. Um, but having said that, go, go to Dodd-Frank for a second. A principle-based financial regulation, and I'm all for regulating banks and financial institutions, I think should be results-oriented, which is the way they do it in England, which you have safety and soundness, you have basic provisions of you've got to keep adequate capital and the government official has the ultimate authority to decide what, what, what the cap capital is, go in there. If you create what they've done with Dodd-Frank, it just becomes like the tax code. It just gets gamed. And yes, all the banks are going in there because they don't like the game that's being played. It's going to end up being a worse game. So by trying to solve the problem with too much detail and not enough of right and wrong, they're going to make the problem worse. Dodd-Frank should be a version of right and wrong. And it ought to give government officials the authority to go in and do right and wrong and give you the authority to kick out the political leaders who don't do it that way. You know, if the political leaders are on the take. And that's the, you know, the, the downside of democracy is we're only, it's only as good as the people we elect. But now, it's only as good as the people we elected 30 or 40 years ago. And it's just a paralyzed system that's, that I agree with you, it's dictated by special interests, but special interests on all sides. And I would, before Dr. Klan, I would just simply add that if you go back in the history of this state, 1912, Hiram Johnson, the great progressive, we adopted all of these measures. We had 2.75 million people in the state of California. Today we have 38. And the law, particularly the initiative process, isn't working because it's been taken over by special interest. And in this city, uh, some of us were strongly in favor of a new ballpark. Some people weren't, one of whom filed a series of 14 lawsuits, delayed it for almost three years, cost hundreds of millions of dollars, but he himself bore no responsibility for the consequences. Right. He could do that with, with impunity. Yeah, the question is, is, aren't lawyers part of the problem and how do we solve the, and solve the problem of lawyers? Yes, lawyers are definitely part of the problem. And, uh, and, and we see it again on all sides, on the corporate side as well as on the plaintiff side. You know, 1-800-injury, you know, did you have a fall? So at this point, just to give some examples, everyone focuses on, on crazy lawsuits. There are not that many crazy lawsuits and they don't generally win. What's happened though with the availability of lawsuits is that the culture has changed. Just take children's play. There are no more seesaws, jungle gyms, diving boards, recess, I mean, you merry-go-rounds, you name it. All because people are scared of being sued. And why is that? Because no one on behalf of society has the, even the idea at this point of saying, I hold as a matter of law that a seesaw is a reasonable risk, so unless it's broken or something else, then, then I'm not allowing this claim to go forward. Anybody, any injury, any accident, it can be a lawsuit that goes on for years. Um, uh, in our Atlantic series this month, this month's discussion is reconnecting the system of justice with the goals of society. I have an essay that just came up a few hours ago where I basically argue that judges are the problem and the solution. That judges have to take back the job of judging. That if somebody brings an, ex an excessive claim, the judge should say, well, maybe you've got a claim for you know, whatever, for your lost wages and something for your broken leg, but not for $10 million. I'm not going to let my courtroom be a, be a, a, a tool of extortion for, for you. And they keep claims reasonable, which is, which is the way they do it in, in other countries. And when lawyers, as they often do, I'm a practicing lawyer, bring, make arguments that are completely unjustified in the law or not based on the facts, they ought to be fined or if they do it consistently, disbarred. To, in, in the old days, it, you actually had to get letters of recommendation to join a bar association. Now all you have to do is prove you have a law degree and have never been indicted. You know, it doesn't, there's no character. The whole idea of character has disappeared from, from, from professions. So yes, we have a, you know, we have a legal profession that often operates like feral animals just doing whatever they can get away with. And, and we don't have any mechanism for dealing with it because judges won't enforce it and the bar associations feel that they'll get sued. They do anything about it. So we have to restore the authority of people in professional associations to actually judge people too. 
Right, the question is how could judges make decisions when the legislatures have preempted the field and written so many laws? Well, to a great extent, the legislatures have preempted the field, but judges still retain the inherent power if, it doesn't, if it's not inconsistent with, a, with an explicit statute to, to make rulings, for example, on standards of care uh, and in, 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 in a medical lawsuit or standards of reasonableness in a, in a negligence lawsuit, but they don't have the idea that they're supposed to do it. Um, a Yale law professor is doing an essay for us that'll come out next week on the, on the, in this Atlantic series, uh, arguing the so-called notice pleading, which is the ability of anybody to sue for anything just by filing a complaint and giving it to you and then you have to answer it in discovery, is actually unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution because it allows people to access state power that's what a lawsuit is. It's not an act of freedom. It's an act of state power coming down to a verdict where the sheriff will take your home away. It's just like being indicted. You're just being indicted for money. And so he's claiming that the, he's arguing the system is actually unconstitutional now because it allows a private party much more authority than you would give a public prosecutor. And the private party is just trying to get something for themselves. So the system is fundamentally broken in ways that the legislature is not entirely to blame for. The legislature could solve the problem by passing a statute, and I have a, a draft of such a statute uh, that we've uh, introduced from time to time in, in various legislatures that basically says the judge shall take the responsibility um, you know, when, to decide w when a claim might affect the conduct of people not in the courtroom, like somebody sues that a seesaw is unreasonable or whatever, that affects everybody, to make a ruling as a matter of law as to whether the claim is reasonable or not. It's a very simple thing. The judges have that responsibility because otherwise you've given the power to the claimant. And that's not what law is supposed to be. The whole point of a lawsuit is not a go for anything suit. It's a lawsuit. The law is supposed to actually set these boundaries and nobody's setting the boundaries. Oh wow, that is that's exciting. I want a picture of that. Yeah. America, America around in America. Um, the question is, um, should powers be returned to the state from the federal government? Uh, my view on that is yes, to the greatest extent possible. The, the Catholic doctrine of subsidiarity, where you push responsibility down to the lowest lowest level where it, where it makes sense to do it, whether it's is I think responsibility needs to get pushed down. Teachers need control of the classroom. Principals need control of the schools. States need control of most social services. Absolutely. The federal government, it's just, it's a junk pile. There are 82 separate programs for teacher training. I mean, it's just piled up. You know, that's one of, so one of the advantages of, of, um, of having the kind of overhaul, the spring cleaning that, that we're talking about, is it enable able states to take back much more social services that brings back local control where citizens can actually feel that they're closer to the decisions of democracy and can actually actually make a difference. On the point about simplification, I was talking with Dick Reardon yesterday, the, 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 the former mayor of Los Angeles, and he had the idea, which I actually think is a great idea, so I think we're going to do it, of taking an area of law not be officially appointed to do this. Just take some area. We're talking about the California education laws and rewriting them. Just turning it in, turning a thousand pages into 20 pages of codes. Right, the question is how do you create a centrist uh, Grover uh, Norquist? And the answer to that is it's hard because, and this is to, because Grover trades in hatred and distrust. And the cur our current political parties trade in hatred and distrust. It's almost like they get in a back, road, back room and agree to it, because then they get a lot of fi campaign fan finance money from each side. Um, what we're talking about doing with some centrist members of Congress is having this two-point platform I mentioned. And I'm talking with some other people separately about creating, as long as we have it, although I'm for getting rid of it, a super PAC with tens of millions of dollars in it which would be dry powder available to support candidates of either party who will support <coughs> an overhaul agenda. And so I actually do think you have to translate what I'm saying into power. And uh, recently, uh, a number of centrist Democrats have lost their 
their, uh, they lost their nomination battles because the extremists in the Republic, in the, in the, in the Democratic Party went after them for being centrist and they didn't have, so with this organization, we could have a few million dollars to go, to go support them and people wouldn't even attack their seat at that point. We wouldn't have to spend the money. It just needs to be available. You were talking about how the processes are so convoluted that you can never get to a straight answer. The, the importance of, of law is that it be coherent and reach decisions so that people can move forward in their lives. It needs to be fair and impartial and such, but you need to make, it needs to be coherent, it's not coherent, and it needs to be able to make decisions. In family law in New York, it's now like Dickens. It's a tragedy. You know, uh, families without the money to, to hire a lawyer, which is most families, who are facing really significant issues in their life, you know, child custody or eviction or the like, can't possibly negotiate the convoluted adversarial processes that look so good on paper but are impossible to actually implement in practice if you're not a trained, a trained lawyer. And so you have people milling around for years without getting to a decision, frustrated to death. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy what's happened to, to, to our legal system and to our government where people can't make clear, clear decisions. And that's why I think we need overhaul. Thank you again. Well, that was hugely provocative. <laughs> Who's against common sense? I'm not against it. Um, and we have to be grateful that this man is willing to invest all of his time and energy and effort um, to make people think about things. I'm really grateful. Commongood.org. Commongood Go there. Join up. I'm going to join up this afternoon. Thank you all uh, for coming, and we hope to see you soon. <laughs>